the case. Kodo, solitary angler. Look, look, what do you see when there's nothing to see? An ancient fisherman hooks a suburban housewife. The con. One day as she was relaxing in her favorite chair, Kodo flipped through a book and came upon Ma Huan's 13th century Chinese painting called The Solitary Angler. In the painting, a lone fisherman sits at the bow of a wooden boat in the middle of a vast lake, his fishing line dangling over the side of the boat. Kodo cried out, that's me. That's me as I truly am. I am not that yet. How do I become that? Good evening, all you Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. You get set up here. It's wonderful to be back uh, with the White Heron Sangha. Uh, I love being here. This was actually my very first Sangha over 20 years ago. I remember uh, doing a talk back in uh, March of last year. It was the first Zoom talk of the San Luis Obispo Zen Circle. And I remember mentoring or mentioning at that time uh, to my wife, Carla, she was talking to me actually and said that she just read that we had another six to eight weeks of this lockdown. I said, wow, I wonder how we'll all be feeling two months after two months of this. And here we are, almost a full year down the road. And you know, the scientists, when this all started, had said that uh, at the start of all this, that we could be looking at 18 months to two years. And here we are. So I come this evening feeling a little bit raw. I've been steeped in another racial study workshop this weekend. It was the Zen Peacemakers Race in America, an intimate plunge. Speaking of which, I really appreciated the White Heron Sangha program being mindful of race. So in the midst of uh, this weekend with this workshop, I've also been involved in a team that's caring for a, a very, very close and dear friend who's approaching the end of her life, dying from cancer on hospice. So indeed it's been an intimate and uh, it's been a plunge uh, these last few days. And uh, excuse me for sharing that. We, those of us that do a lot of council work, we usually do a check-in round uh, when we begin. And uh, that was my check-in round. So regardless of all that, thank you for the presence of, thank you for the gift of your presence on this beautiful Sunday evening. And Welcome to the Los Osos Hermitage. We're coming off quite a week. Lawrence Ferenghetti passed last week. And also last week was the 49th day of Mel's passing, Mel Weitzman. It was kind of the end of what we call the Bardo period after 49 days. We had a wonderful service on Zoom actually down at uh, the uh, Zen Center of Los Angeles. And I know that uh, Deborah West actually went, uh, was on a Zoom service as well up in the Bay Area for him. And Mel 
as most of you know, uh, was Norman Fisher's transmission teacher. So it was very, uh, very poignant, very beautiful service as well. So while the pandemic has been slowing down, more and more of us getting shots in the arm, we still went over 517,000 deaths in the US and two, over 2.5 million worldwide. Earlier in the month, we celebrated, earlier in this month of uh, February, we celebrated the uh, Chinese New Year. And one of my Dharma brothers, uh, Reverend Dharma Joy, he noted that we're coming off the year of the white metal rat and entering the year of the white metal ox or cow. So the year of the rat is touted to be a year of turbulence in which change and disaster are commonplace. The year of the ox is supposed to be calm, stable, economically prosperous. The words used for the ox are uh, diligent, gentle, hardworking, and reliable. May it be so. And I noted that the spring equinox is uh, just 20 days away. Yesterday was also the full snow moon. And I'm sure my daughter in Austin, uh, Texas, who, and they've received a lot of snow of late. I'm sure she appreciated that. I got to watch the moon set this morning early morning set in the West. I also found out it was Maka Buka Day, which is also called Sangha Day. So many Buddhists celebrate this day in honor of the celebration, which denotes the spontaneous assembling of 1,250 monks, supposedly came from around the globe to pay reverence to the Lord Buddha who at the time recited the Ovada Patimaka, or fundamental teaching. It's a big festival in Southeast Asia. I wasn't that familiar with it, but on the, the evening of the Maga full moon, every temple, for example, in Thailand, holds a candlelight parade to praise the Maga Puja Day. And I can imagine seeing, they said, 100,000 candles lit with this large gathering uh, must be amazing to watch. We have a tradition when offering a Dharma talk and other programs where we acknowledge and honor the Native American heritage. And here, of course, where most of us are is the Yaki Tutu Yaki Tahini or Northern Chumash people of the San Luis Obispo region. So I'd like to pay, to acknowledge and pay my deep respect to the Chumash people and elders and ancestors past, present and future. And I acknowledge and offer deep gratitude to this land of the Northern Chumash and the water that supports us as we're gathered here tonight, right here in, in Zoom land. And I invite you to join me in that acknowledgement, putting your hands in gasho and making a short bow. So this koan was taken from the book of Householder Koans. And I don't know if you can see that. The byline is waking up in the land of attachments. And hopefully you can see that. Now, this particular koan is taken from a section of the book called Many Gates of Practice. 
Other sections are about the home, raising children, work, loss, illness, old age and death. And this section, Many Gates of Practice. This was a book put together by uh, Eve Marco and my teacher, Roshi Agyoku Nikau. And it was meant for lay people. And there are uh, many, many, uh, it's, it's real world stuff. Basically they got stories from their students and they made those stories into koans. So the book begins with one, the mom gives instructions. The boy looks at his shoes and dances. The mom repeats the instructions. The boy looks into the air and continues to shuffle his feet. The mom gives instructions for the third time, her voice rising in frustration. The boy dances away and says, mom, why do you have to be such a bitch? Real world stories. Another, just to give you another example, called my mother's diaper. Two years into being my mother's primary caregiver, she began to need adult diapers. She adapted to them without comment. She had Alzheimer's. For me, the ritual of sitting on the edge of the tub first thing in the morning, facing mom as she is seated on the toilet, sliding her pants and diaper first over her knees and then off each foot has become a meditation. How heavy is my mother's diaper? The idea for the book came from Eve um, many years ago and she was in uh, a conference in New Delhi she was there with Bernie Glassman, that's her, her husband. And this was a huge worldwide conference of Buddhists. And she can remember distinctly being at the airport and seeing that the vast majority were monks. And these monks would be accompanied with lay people. And these lay people would be, because the monks can't touch money, the lay people were there to uh, you know, pay for the uh, SIM cards to put in the cell phones, if you remember SIM cards back a ways, back a while ago, and to buy the bottled water, to buy tickets. And it, uh, she said they actually looked down on the folks from Japanese or from Japan because the folks from Japan are no longer monks. They're priests, they're not celibate anymore. That's a long story, but there's, it's actually a political thing where it was mandated that the monks marry. So there was only one Soto Zen priest invited and one Rinzai priest invited. And Bernie Glassman was only there because of his involvement with socially engaged Buddhism. And that was it. So she determined there's really a need for a book for householders because we live in this world of attachments. We live in relationships. We haven't left everything behind to live in a monastery. So this world, this is our practice. I can remember being uh, in a face-to-face -face meeting with a young woman who was a mother and she was bemoaning the fact that she just couldn't practice. She couldn't spend enough time practicing with her role as a mother. And my response was, the children are your practice. Now, related to uh, Roshi Eve's visit in New Delhi, she had talked about Hans Kuhn, who's a Swiss, Swiss Catholic priest, theologian and author, 
and he's worked with this uh, started the foundation for global ethic and so he's done a lot of work on comparative religions and he was looking he's analyzing the main lines of approach taken by islam hinduism and buddhism and was giving christian responses to the values and the challenges that each tradition each tradition had so regarding Buddhism, he thought that the biggest challenge was going to be in the West was going to be dealing with the monastic tradition. And I think we're doing that. Long before that, the British historian Arnold Toynbee wrote, the coming of Buddhism to the West may well, be, may well prove to be the most important event of the 20th century. And here we are. Eve's point is that we can make change in our everyday life, our everyday lives as householders. Every moment is a moment for awakening. Some are saying that the, in the current circumstances, the current events of our time, that this is a moment in history, a moment for awakening. The point of the householder koans is that every moment can be a moment for awakening. As lay people, this is our field of practice. This messy life. As Eve says, this glorious, messy life. And it's not about finding solutions. It's about waking up to life as it is perhaps leaning into aspects of our lives that have been pushing away, we've been pushing away or struggling with. So Kodo in our story, our koan, is a real person. And this, is, this really happened, this event. She's actually Roshi Merle Kodo boy. This being the last day of Black History Month, it seems appropriate because Roshi Koto made history as a black woman. She's the first ever African-American woman to have received Dharma transmission in Zen Buddhism. She, like me, is a Dharma heir of Wendy Agyoko Nikau, who was the co-author of the Householder book. She was Roshi's very first Dharma uh, heir and so she, I think I'm the ninth. And so she is uh, my elder sister in my immediate spiritual family. We spent a wonderful year together. Uh, Roshi Gyoku went on sabbatical uh, for a year and Kodo came and took over for a year. So we got to practice intimately for an entire year, which was uh, absolutely wonderful. Koto was born in Texas during the era, era of segregation. Her family, like most African-American families of this period, suffered the pain and hardship of racial discrimination. And before she came to Zen, she was a, a licensed uh, psychotherapist. So when Koto saw Ma Huan's painting, it cut through to her very essence. And how is it that a African-American woman in New Jersey was called forth by a painting of an ancient Chinese fisherman? The essence of life, the original nature itself as captured by that artist Ma Huan resonated throughout her body. It didn't matter that the painting was of a different century, an unknown place, and an unfamiliar culture. Nothing that resembled Kodo's, Kodo or her life. So what was it that pierced through all the layers, time, place, and person? What awakened in Kodo? And I weave in and out of uh, the commentaries. 
that Eve and Roshi had written, their reflections. Mahuan's painting exudes stillness and silence, a sense of infinite vastness. A humble fisherman appears in this vastness. He's neither separate from it nor other than it. He is woven of the same nature as the fishing line, the water, the entire universe itself. Seeing this, Kodo felt a stirring deep within. She sensed immediately that there was something for her to uncover about her own being that Ma Huan had captured. From this moment on, the urge to know that consumed Kodo's life. So in her own words, she said, the painting called to me in my own voice. I immediately sought out more books. Uh, she sat in her bedroom on a pillow and blankets. And that's how she started her own practice. She did this for a few years, reading books. And she contemplated about going to a Zen center, but she was just wary of the racial, racial tension that she imagined she would face by going to a training center. She commented, I knew no black people practicing Zen. The thought of entering a Zendo knowing nothing of the etiquette and ritual was frightening enough. Being the own black, only black person there would, she felt, draw more attention than she could stand. But eventually she made her way there to a training center and started training with uh, a sister, actually a Catholic sister, Janet Richardson, who was a Dharma heir of Robert Kennedy, uh, who was a Catholic priest. And eventually she has Dharma transmission, as I mentioned, from Roshi Agyoku Nikau. So have you had such an experience? Have you had a similar calling? Now, Roshi Igyoku tells of her own story. This is my teacher and her meeting the Dharma. She was challenged to make it through a seven day period, a seven day session, which is our retreats. And she did that. And during the session, something awakened so powerfully inside that she just had to follow it wherever it took her. And it was pretty dramatic. She left her marriage, her job, the city where she lived, and followed whatever was needed to seek out to know herself. As she said, when Buddha calls to Buddha, there is no stopping this powerful movement within. And there's so many portals, so many ways of doing this. And I look at our own lineage right back to Buddha. The young prince Siddhartha witnesses old age, sickness and death, and then a tranquil look on the the face of an ascetic. He leaves his palace, a young wife and son, giving up a life of comfort and ease. Deborah West shared this story with you as well about Dogen, who is the one of the co-founders of the Soto School of Zen. Seven-year-old boy at his mother's funeral, watching the smoke rise from the incense and realizing the impermanence of life. And that begins his spiritual journey. Now, my own, my own story. Um, I want to share just a little, a little bit of it, and uh, I find myself uh, feeling very much like an old story that uh, I picked up from the Hidden Lamp, 
stories from 25 centuries of awakened women. And uh, interestingly, Norman Fisher wrote the introduction for this, uh, this collection. So this is a story about Tishan. And Tishan was this great Diamond Sutra scholar. And at that time, there was this division in Zen of the Northern School and Southern School. And the Southern School was a proponent of sudden awakening. And the Northern School was more into the uh, study of the sutras. So he's hell bent. He's going to lock horns with a Zen master from the South and tell him what for, uh, this scholar. So Tatian travels to the South uh, on that trip. And en route, he runs across a woman on the roadside selling refreshments. He asks, who are you? She responds, I'm an old woman selling rice cakes. He said, I'll take some rice cakes. She says, venerable priest, why do you want them? He said, I'm hungry and I need some refreshment. She said, venerable priest, what are you carrying in your bag there? He said, haven't you heard that I'm the king of the Diamond Sutra? I have thoroughly penetrated all of its levels of meaning. Here, I have my notes and commentaries from this scripture. Hearing this, the old woman said, I have one question, venerable priest, may I ask it? He said, go ahead, basically said, give it to me. She said, I've heard it said that according to the Diamond Sutra, past mind is ungraspable, current mind is ungraspable, and future mind is ungraspable. So where is the mind that you wish to refresh with rice cakes? Venerable priest, if you can answer, I will sell you a rice cake. But venerable priest, if you cannot answer, I will not sell you any rice cakes. At that, Tishan was speechless. And the old woman got up abruptly and left without selling Tishan a single rice cake. So I relate to that story. Uh, I was kind of, for decades, kind of puffed up in my own intellectual understanding over the years. Now, I don't pretend to be any kind of a great scholar uh, like Tayshan or like James Coleman, but like Tayshan, uh, and if you don't like swearing, you can turn your volume down because I'm going to say four letter word, but like Tayshan, I thought I was a hot shit on a silver pla platter, but really found myself to be cold turds on a paper plate. So 50 years of age, decades of being what I called an intellectual closet Buddhist, suddenly reading an issue of Tricycle Magazine on a camping trip in Big Sur, I read an article, it was an anniversary of Herman Hesse's book, Siddhartha, that had meant so much to me in college many years before. At that point, I knew that I needed to work on my meditation. As I put it more, I needed to spend more cushion time. I needed to get out of my head. And for me, that also meant finding a teacher I could work with. So I did kind of a combo, perhaps, between Kodo and Roshi Gyoko. I lived here on the Central Coast as a layperson, uh, Monday through Thursday, and then traveled to Great Dragon Mountain, the Zen Center of Los Angeles, every weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, week after week, month after month, year after year. Now. Being here tonight on this Zoom meeting, if you're a regular member of 
the White Heron Sangha or the San Luis Obispo Zen Center or some Sangha, it's probably because something has stirred in you. What is it? What is it that Kodo experienced? Perhaps you recall the moment when you full uh, felt some kind of a pull towards something beyond the conventional and material, beyond the division of you and me. And it's this, it's a shift against, away from a self-centered life. It's a shift from this self-centered way of living in which your ideas and desires form a basis for everything. What is calling you forth? So your essential nature, I like to think, is continually calling you home. When you return home to yourself, you realize that you've always been home, dwelling just as you are in that as that, the treasure house itself, the utterly unique being that you are is the perfect expression of that. Sitting here, staring at a computer screen, you are the perfect harmony of form and emptiness. And that should sound familiar to many of us from the Heart Sutra. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. We're complete and whole, lacking nothing, and cannot and need not be otherwise. Maybe some of this sounds familiar to those of you that were in the Lotus Sutra workshop with Norman Fisher. You know, Zen masters say, you don't sit in Zazen or meditation in order to become a Buddha. You sit because you are a Buddha to begin with. Your treasure house is waiting to be uncovered, opened and used freely. So tell me, how will you know it? So many portals to practice. What was your portal? And how are you practicing? What is your journey? What are your edges? What are you confronting in your daily life? Are you being curious? Are you investigating your own life and your own mind? And you know, your meditation is your teacher. Buddha's last words, and of course, there have been recording of so many different last words that he said, but one of those was certainly being a light unto yourself. And Dogen saying the same thing about turning the light inward. But do you feel you're lacking something that you need to get? What is it that you are not yet? Maizumi Roshi talked all the time about closing the gap between who you think you are and who you truly are. Close the gap. He would say that all the time between the self, capital S, S, and yourself. So what is this gap? We have this beautiful mudra that we use all the time, gasho. Ga means to come together, to unite, to meet, show, palms of hands. Uchiyama wrote a poem called Gasho revering. In Gasho, two are one, and even that one becomes hidden. The form of reality of thought released all heaven and earth, the profundity of reality. 
So looking at a, a different lens or through a different lens, many of us, myself included, are taking this plunge into racial studies, now seeing this gap between how we think we are and how we actually are. My smug view of myself as this white liberal male being exposed. Oh, I would think I'm not a racist. I'm, I'm a good person. Well, Roshi Eve says, you know, it's okay to sit in the gap. So I'm sitting with my own white supremacy, my own racist worldview. It ain't comfortable. I shared this with my teacher, Roshi. She said, good. It's tough work, but it pales in comparison to what's been endured by people of color for centuries. Resma Menicum, author of My Grandmother's Hands, spoke of this, spoke of doing this tough work, getting intimate with others, with other white people, and basically, no, it's not a quick fix. You're looking at three to 10 years. You must have a malleable heart. And I think of uh, Pema Chodron in her writings where she's saying, often saying, we need to soften that which is hard in our heart. Albert Lowe, another Zen guy, wrote, what we fear most, that we must do. We love this I so much that most of our life is spent protecting, maintaining, affirming, nourishing it. We invest it in a cause, a flag, an ideology, a country, possessions, or another person. And when we do so, then that cause, flag, ideology, country becomes precious. It too becomes unique, distinct, separate, and superior. One master said, the moon is still the same old moon. The flowers are not different. But now I see that I am the thingness of things. And, you know, I, I want to uh, end here. I didn't mean for this to be just a total lecture. What I wanted was uh, to hear what's on your mind and how, uh, if this story even connects with you. And I don't know if you folks do much uh, council practice or not, but I suspect that White Heron Sangha has created a container where people feel safe to share. And I'll end with uh, an excerpt uh, dedication from the Gate of Sweet Nectar, which we did this morning at the end of the conference. And this is the signature service or liturgy uh, from the Zen peacemakers. In the dedication or part of it read, we call upon ourselves to learn our racial karma and to dedicate ourselves to creating a world in which we forever remember the causes of suffering and forever act to end suffering. May we always have the courage to bear witness, to see ourselves as other and other as ourself. May all beings be satisfied with our offering of the Dharma cultivate right wisdom, liberate all beings, and allow the seeds of wisdom to flourish forever. Thank you, Mark. So the floor is open.
Yeah, Claudia. Well, um, Mark, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, very, very, really touched me. And I wanted to respond in the beginning. You asked, what was it that Kodo might have seen in the picture? And when you had it up there, I was looking at it. And the only way we know that it's in water is that it's a boat, but we see just very lightly little movements of water movement things. And there's no uh, nothing else in the picture. It's And it's so... It's kind of silent and and timeless. There are no really, not much in the way of markers as to where it is, when it is, and um, you know, there's no real action except you do get the sense of the water streaming past the boat. But and so I think that there's something just timeless there, and and really. Um, and you said something too about when you see nothing, when you look at nothing, what do you see? Something to that effect too. And it, it seems like that could be a caption for that picture. You know, it's, it's, um, it just is very evocative while being so simple. And anyway, so that's what I was seeing in it. And it, it seems so, well, it's almost like suchness. You know, it suggests yeah. suchness. And I think for Kodo that, um, Claudia, that it was, you know, it's, like, it's our quintessential Buddhism, this idea of uh, form and emptiness mm -hmm. and that they are really one and the same. And I don't like to use words to express it because it's really, there are no words, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, um, Uchiyama. No, it wasn't Uchiyama. It was uh, another Zen guy. And I think I may have shared this before. He always talks about the fraction and uh, the numerator is represents, um, it's an alpha character. So it represents phenomena. Anything can be up there. And the bottom is the infinity sign for essential nature. We call it Buddha nature. We call it Mu. The point is, I mean, to talk about it, we talk about phenomena, we talk about essential nature, but the fact is, it's the whole fraction. Mark, I appreciated that you read from some women authors and that these koans come from, you know, a place that we can all relate to. Um, and Zen has always felt a little, my first tradition that I was introduced to, it's always felt a little intimidating. <laughs> it's a good way to say it. But um, I think that books like this are, are making an effort to make it more touchable, more um, relatable, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. That's just my impression. I think, I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, life is our koan. And what life do we live? You're a hospice nurse. The things you see. We're mothers and fathers. We have things happening all the time. And that's that's our koan. I think it would, my Zumi would uh, always say, um, life is Zen. <laughs> and you know, Bernie Glassman would say that over and over all the time. And it wasn't, um, and he would say, uh, at one point he would say, yeah, I think I get it but it was after he had his stroke and it was, they were having uh, at his little, at his little place in New York uh, where he and Eve lived, they would have, I think it was like a Friday evening schmooze where people would just come over. And one of his last word, well, it, it was his last public words where he said, life is Zen. And he said, you know, Maizumi Roshi, his teacher said that over and over again. 
And I never quite got it until now. And that was his kind of his last public words. Uh, and he died nine days later. Anybody else out there? Hopefully it's uh, it, it struck, you know, that you can relate to some of this. I'll chime in, Mark. Um, hi, Rosemary. Hi, Mark. Uh, what you were saying about the story of how you found it and something happened. I Recently, I've become more and more struck with how common that is. The more people I talk to, Pretty much everybody has one of those stories of how they were struggling along or maybe they weren't even struggling, but they knew something was missing and then something happened and they found where they were supposed to be. And we, in the center, I, and I know you've been at the White Heron Saga Center. I love that we have that Thich Nhat Hanh calligraphy, I have arrived, I'm home. <laughs> exactly. And that was, yeah, one of the lines, yeah, that uh, when we do all this work and finally return home, we realize we were here all along. Yes. And I think for so many people, that moment where they find what they were looking for, they realize they're home. Exactly. Yeah. Good to see you. And I hope uh, that we get to come back to the White Heron Sangha as well at some point, <laughs> even if it's in a hybrid model, uh, you know, being on Zoom and then with few people in the uh, facility. Mark, Mark, I just wanted to say something. The two things you shared about the one about minding the gap and between the the real self and the perceived self. And then also the fraction. Those two things were um, very impactful and helpful to me. I think it's having the visual. Um, and I just, I wanted to thank you for those two because I'm really going to take those away. And it's, 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 it's a pithy kind of, that's the pith right there for me. So thank you. Hi, Mark. This is Alice. Hi, Alice. How are so, you? I'm I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Glad to be here. Good to see you. Yeah. Um, the I've had a few of those experiences, you know, where, you know, especially, you know, with the story um, about seeing a piece of art and just feeling this total connection with it. But for me, it always feels like I'm um, remembering something I've forgotten, you know, um, that there's, that it doesn't, it doesn't come as like a, oh, I need to follow this so much as I just need to remember it. It's, it's weird. <laughs> I don't think weird at all. I mean, that's what's happening. You know, it's already there. So we have glimpses. I, I can remember who was, I can't remember actually who it was saying that, but uh, like reading Dogen, Zenji, um, years ago, it's just like, just didn't understand it. You'd have glimpses of that. And now years later, it's a uh, different perspective on it. Uh, I think greater understanding. And as we all do this, you know, our, our awakening deepens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you. You're so welcome.
Anybody else? You can share your own experiences. It'd be wonderful to hear some, though I know the hour is late. We have time for one more story. In Zen, we're used to silence. So, <laughs> so we're OK. We're OK with it. Well, I'll share another snippet then, if nobody else wants to chime in. And that was uh, from one of my mentors, uh, Bernie Glassman. And he said, um, he talked about Kobo Daishi, who lived in the, uh, oh, like late 700s, I think. And he was the founder of the Shingon sect. Enlightenment by, oops, sorry, I lost my video. We can tell the depth of a person's enlightenment by how they serve others. If they're focused on themselves, they have awakened to the oneness of themselves. If they're focused on their family, they have awakened to the oneness of their family. If they're focused on their nation, they have awaken to the oneness of their nation, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, in my opinion, the Dalai Lama has awakened to the oneness of the universe. <laughs> May that be so for all of us. Thank you so much, Mark, for coming tonight. Always good to be here. And it's great to sit with some of your Sangha as well tonight. Oh, good. Yeah, I didn't even see who was here. <laughs> I see him out there. <laughs> All right, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful week and um, we'll see each other here and there. Be well, be safe. Good night, good night. everyone. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good to see everyone. Thank, Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Thank you so much. Thanks for hosting, Susan. You're very welcome. Good night, Daggy. <laughs> Good night, Marina. Good night, Gabor. He's sleeping. <laughs> Good night, Christina. <laughs> I'm going to close now. <laughs>